This video is brought to you in collaboration with wowhead.com. Hello everyone. A heads up before we begin. We are going to deep dive into Shadowlands lore and we're going to speculate a little bit on what is going on as some juicy stuff has come forward. So be warned, spoilers ahead. Now we all know that this is World of Warcraft and peace hardly ever lasts. Be it fighting between the Alliance and the Hordes, defending the world of Azeroth from threats like the Old Gods or the Burning Legion. War. It is the lifeblood of this world. And as we know from BlizzCon, Blizzard, they have the plans to open up the storytelling, dive deeper into the cosmic forces that the universe is built upon, light and shadow, order and disorder, life and death. A few months ago, we talked about the cosmology and potential future story of Warcraft, but the story of the Shadowlands is being further revealed and more pieces of the puzzle are made available. Like when we got the Shadowlands Afterlife's Maldraxxus episode, featuring Draka arriving in the Shadowlands, figuring out how Maldraxxus works and training with the House of Eyes. From the unyielding warrior that she was in life, now she gains a set of particular skills that make her a master spy. Skills that are then put to use as she infiltrates a legion stronghold and steals some information. As some have noticed, the location they used, it looks identical to a shot used in the Illidan Harbinger episode. And they've even pointed out on Twitter that she was stealing a map from the legion on another world. Why is still a good question. Perhaps they're invested in what the demons have been doing or it lines up with the prime objective of those that end up in Maldraxxus, which is to defend the infinite realms of the Shadowlands. Defend the Shadowlands, some of you asked. Why does the Shadowlands need defending? But that's simply because the Shadowlands, it's, it's not this pocket dimension that you can't enter. Even in our own stories, we've seen followers or beings traverse the realm of the Shadowlands. So it's not like it's this impossible plane of existence that you cannot attack. In Bastion, we even get to witness an assault from the Void, where a paragon of the past sacrificed all she was to defend her realm. In Maldraxxus, Draka mentions defending her realm against the Light, although that might have been altered by now. But we can also read memorials. One has been scratched out, for some reason. One is for Lady Quimby of the House of Rituals. Let this memorial stand to remind us of her valor against those from beyond and one for Mezil the Knight from the House of Eyes. The memory of your death to the Void Lords is honored among your house. And this might very well be the first time that the Void Lords are actually mentioned by their name in the game. Then in Ardenweald, the Drust are trying to come in, and Revendreft's all part of the zone is being scored by the Light, which drives the Venfair insane, with quest dialogue suggesting that the Light is doing this out of retribution for something that the Venfair did. Point being, outside forces can and have attacked the Shadowlands before. The cosmic forces are in an eternal tug of war, constantly vie for power over each other, but if one of them fell, all worlds would fall into chaos. Balance must remain. Cho, why would me want the Banshee Queen in charge? No. Sure, I'm an Alpha War and it, but that's Sylvanas. She be tipping the scales too far. Balance be important. The world of Warcraft just got a little bit bigger as the war it now goes into a cosmic scale. Considering that all the cosmic forces, they're tugging on that rope, they want to tip the balance into their favor, you have to wonder, what about the Shadowlands? What has the cosmic realm of death been up to? And here is a small little book called Enemy Infiltration Preface. It's been data mined, and man oh man, does it blow open the story in a major way. The realm of death, it's been quite busy. Let's go through it together and see what we can figure out. See what's been happening behind the curtain. To our most wondrous and resplendent master, I am pleased to state that, after a lengthy study of arrivals, I have completed my observations. Please accept this briefing in advance of my complete report, which shall follow forthwith. We anticipate that certain of our targets will be more challenging to topple than others, but each is prone to manipulation in different ways, and our agents have already woven themselves into their very fabric. This is, after all, the solemn duty for which you sired us. 
as you are fond of saying, once a desire is understood, it can be exploited. Enough prologue. Allow me to summarize our findings. This is written from the Shadowlands perspective, or the Realm of Death, as more clues will follow. So their rivals, they're the other cosmic forces. The true identity of their master, that's kept hidden. But it's a very ambiguous description of him. Wondrous and resplendent, not to mention that he sired them. A lot of eyes are turning towards Sire Denephrius and wonder if he is the one that sent out these agents. On a mission to infiltrate and manipulate in different ways, there is also a race in Warcraft that has a long history of manipulation, namely the Dreadlords, and from the moment that the Nephrys' model became available, people began to wonder if there's potentially a connection between him and the Nafrazim. Visually, they do look very similar. And then there's also that line about Once a desire is understood, it can be exploited. I wonder if Blizzard has perhaps been binging Lucifer like I have. Tell me, what is it that you truly desire? In many ways, the Titans will be the easiest to manipulate. Their singular goal is to impose structure upon everything they see. Show them a force that opposes their drive for order, and they will be consumed by their urge to eradicate it. Their pantheon, so seemingly united in purpose, is vulnerable to fracturing. What I really love is how there's a distinction made between the Titans in general and their pantheon. We know a whole lot about the pantheon, their members cruising across the cosmos, bringing order to the worlds as they look for more of their kind slumbering within the planets. Apparently they did find them, and apparently they helped them wake up as well. And while those titans, they did whatever titans did, we haven't really seen them in our story yet. While the pantheon, they carried on their mission. Imagine at some point finding a titan homeworld, a titan plane of existence. Something that was also mentioned as a possibility, mentioned in an interview between Tally Essen and lead narrative designer Steve Denniser. It would be so cool to see different kind of titans and titan worlds. Imagine the powers that the Pantheon has. Imagine what all those other titans can do. And the report also states that if they would show them a force that opposes their drive for order, they would be consumed by their urge to eradicate it. That would be the domain of this order. Fell, demons, twisting nether, and of course the titans, they wouldn't let these forces run rampant. Sargeras and Agrimar, they took on the demonic forces, deciding to imprison them in Mardum, as demons, they only truly die within the twisting nether. Yet, there was another on the cosmic scale that worked against the plans of the titans. Sargeras stumbled upon a world with a slumbering titan inside, but no happy dreams could be found here, as this world was infected with the old gods. Dark beings sent out into the physical universe by the Void Lords to hopefully land on a slumbering titan and corrupt it. The planets had also been discovered by the Navrazim, and they were there, chilling with the old gods, basking in their dark powers. Sargeras, he captured these dreadlords and ruthlessly interrogated them, trying to discover what was going on. It was the dreadlords that told him what they had discovered. That if the powers of the void were successful in corrupting a slumbering titan, that it would awaken as an unspeakably dark creature. No power in creation. Not even the Pantheon would be able to stand against it. In time, the Warp Titan would consume all matter and energy in the universe, bringing every mode of existence under the Void Lord's will. Sargeras, the undefeated champion of the Titans, knew fear for the first time. And it was this moment that caused him to form his Burning Legion, strike out against the other members of the Pantheon, and then set out on his mission to stop the Void Lord's plans by destroying any corruption that he could find. Just like the report said it would. And we also know that the whole Sargeras turned into the dark side. That all took place a very, very long time ago. Which also gives a small indication just how old these plans and schemes are. The Void Lords all but welcome us with open arms. They are so preoccupied with their fouls and truths that they ignore the lies we sow in their very midst. I believe we can leverage their vast reach to position them as a foil against their other rivals. We remain wary though, since they are observant of multiple outcomes. It is conceivable that they can anticipate our coming. The truth of the void is also something that the Locust Walker discussed with Illyria Windrunner as she went through her void training. 
The light, it seeks one path, and it shuns all others as lies. Whereas the shadow, it seeks every possible path, and sees them all as truth. This might be connected to the Windrunner comic. As the void, it became very loud and wanted Illyria to take out Sylvanas. We also heard some whispers from Ilgunov, for example, or Nazuf, which are connected to the events in the Shadowlands, so their assumption that the Void could see them coming, it seems to be correct. And how has the Void influenced the rivals? Well, order and disorder, they were hit or taken over by Sargeras. Life, assuming that the Emerald Dream is connected to life, that was hit with the Emerald Nightmare. And then Light, well, Light is a natural opposite of the Void, so not a whole lot of manipulation was needed. Similar to the Titans, the Naru and their keepers are singular in purpose. Their adherence to a linear path is an obvious shortcoming. They savor nothing more than being proved right. So if they believe they have converted one of us to their precious light, they will trust that agent implicitly. Like the Titans and the Pantheon, here too they make a distinction between the Naru and their keepers. Can't wait to find out what other major players in the source of light that they have come up with. So if they believe they have converted one of us to their precious light, is another reason why the Nafrazim seem to be connected to this, as in Legion we met up with High Commander Lofrexion, he is a dreadlord infused with the light, a member of the army of the light that is served under the prime Naru Zera. Not a whole lot is known about our friend Lofrexion. We do know that he was part of the Burning Legion until converted by the light. He was the one that recruited Illyria and Trevelyan into their army. The Golden One claims a vacant throne. The Crown of Light will bring only darkness. He was the one who told Illyria about the Locust Walker, set her on a path of mastering her void abilities. And then he was the one who pleaded for her life, which actually made Zera hesitate. They will trust it, agents leading to Illyria staying alive and eventually reconnecting with Azeroth. We joined them and the army of the light in the war against the Legion. And remember how certain Zera was in that one linear path that she had foreseen, the destiny that she tried to impose upon Illidan. The light is your destiny. The adherents of life are the most insidious of opponents, perhaps because their nature is so antithetical to our own. Still, we learn much from observing the link between their plane and Ardenweald, and we have high confidence that a vulnerability has been identified. Our operative has already gained the trust of her targets. And typical, if I pronounce it right, it means directly opposed or contrasted, opposite of the forces that are making these reports. That is why, since life would be their opposite, that this report is coming out of the domain of death. There is one link that we can observe in Arnawild, as it's connected to the Emerald Dream. That would indicate that the domain of life is in fact the Emerald Dream, which blows open what we've known about this realm so far. And it's not the first time that this happens. Back in the War of the Ancients trilogy, the Emerald Dream, it was described as this blueprint of Azeroth with multiple layers. Layers that Malfurion could use to do things like spy on Queen Azara. It was the domain of Yesera, a domain that the Druids were invited in. It was the Emerald Dream. And then the Chronicles, it started to add a whole lot more to the Emerald Dream, like being an ethereal realm of spirits and untamed nature that exists alongside the world of Azeroth. Forged by the Keepers to act as a map for the evolutionary path of Azeroth's flora and fauna. Now even the Chronicles is a little bit unclear about them either creating the Emerald Dream or simply tapping into it. Perhaps this domain, it expands much further than just Azeroth and contains many more secrets. Like how the Shadowlands, it seemingly overlaps all realities, all domains, everybody ends up in the Shadowlands. And since Ardenweald is part of the Shadowlands, it's not hard to imagine that the Emerald Dream, it might do the same. There's a whole lot that they could potentially add here and clarify. Now we have the highest confidence that the vulnerability has been identified. Our operative has already gained the trust of her targets. I am having a really hard time trying to figure out what they're talking about here. A vulnerability and a target to gain trust with. If I had to come up with a prominent figure to represent the Emerald Dream, then the one that comes to mind 
that she is Sarah. She is the green dragon aspect, charged with watching over the Emerald Dream. But I don't recall a she that Ysera would put her trust in. Unless we really want to go crazy and talk about a loon. But then there's also this whisper of Ilganov. The vassal of life disguises his treachery. Beware the eyes of greed. And while Ysera is literally found in a vessel within Ardenweald, her eyes are now blue as her fate is tied to the domain, and what kind of treachery would she even disguise? It's an interesting one to be certain. Perhaps when the story of the Shadowlands shifts more in the direction of life, perhaps when we run into the sister of the Winter Queen, perhaps we'll find out what they're talking about. Do you have a sister, mortal? You are certainly as vexing as mine. And, as previously discussed, our position within the plane of disorder is proceeding flawlessly. Consuming fell energy is not a pleasant process, but a necessary one. The bit about not enjoying fell, it had me wonder if we're actually talking about the Dreadlords here. The Origin of the Demons and the Nafrezim, as we know it from the Chronicles, that states that just as in the Great Dark Beyond, life had also arisen in the Twisting Nether. The creatures that emerged from this turbulent realm were known as demons. They'd been formed as a result of the light and void energies that had bled together at the borders of the Twisting Nether. The demons embraced their ferocious passions and reveled in pushing the boundaries of their power heedless of the consequences. Many of these aberrations indulged in the highly volatile energy that pervaded the nether. Some learned to wield the all-consuming powers of fell magic. Before long, these bloodthirsty demons clawed their way into the physical universe, terrorizing mortal civilizations and bringing ruin to world after world. Why would the process of consuming fell not be an enjoyable experience if we're talking about creatures that are born from a realm suffused with the stuff? But maybe, even to the demons, the fell is not actually delicious. Alternatively, perhaps what the Nephrius actually send out were not originally dreadlords, but rather his Venfeir. By going to the Twisting Nether, infiltrating the plane of disorder and consuming that fell, they then changed into the Nafrezim. Then they hit the domain of order in the form of fighting and converting Sargeras. The domain of light with their agent Lofraxion. Now for the domain of void and life, it's, it's still very much unknown who infiltrated these areas. It might be really cool to actually see Zalatov given credit for this. Imagine Zalatov originally being one of the Nafrius' agents that he sent out. They then went into the domain of the Void, like those that went to the domain of Disorder and got in contact with Fel. These ones would get in contact with the Void. And because the Void, it looks at all possible paths as truth. They eventually uncovered their plots, they eventually uncovered what Zalatov was trying to do, and they punished her by putting her in the blade. Then the domain of life, as I mentioned earlier, it's still quite mysterious. But to give more credit to them originally being dreadlords that were sent out, we do have Sire the Nephrius being called the Lord of Dreads. And then an interesting recent find by Nerissa at Wowhead. Apparently the book is found in Revendrefts. Another connection to Sire the Nephrius in a tower called Spire of Unseen Guests. That's a term used by Belnazar himself to describe the Dreadlords, Talkitun, or Unseen Guests in our language. It doesn't go against what the Chronicle says either, as from the Chronicles we read about the Nafrezim emerging from the Twisting Nether. It could be that the origin actually comes from the Shadowlands, as Draka, she has shown us that they're not stuck in there. The deception you have architected will bear fruit in ages to come. As ever, we shall serve as your unseen hands. We will poison every host foolish enough to invite us into their midst. I remain, as always, your faithful servants. Such a small book drops a whole lot of delicious lore and possibilities. They weren't kidding when they said that they're going to do more with the cosmic powers in the Warcraft universe. Having the origin of the Dreadlords, potentially linked to the Nefrius and the Shadowlands, that also opens up a lot of potential story connections that we hadn't made before. Like the Dreadlords experimenting with necromancy during the War of the Ancients. 
The time that the Dreadlords hooked up Kiel Jaden with Frostmourne and the Helm of Domination. The dark paw of Arthas Walks to become the Lich King, chasing down Melganus to the cold heart of Northrend. Varimafras hanging out in the Undercity with Sylvanas, ultimately betraying the Banshee Queen to summon Sir Garrus and failing him. Or did he fail him, or was this all part of some grand scheme that was going on, who knows? Now I've had a fair few of you ask what I think of the Shadowlands so far. And while it's near impossible to predict how the expansion is going to play out, the story, the story part, it definitely has me intrigued and I hope it's going to deliver. It's late at night and I was lying in my bed thinking about this video, thinking about what they're doing to the story potentially of the Nafrazim. Say that this is all true because keep in mind that this is all speculation, right? We have no idea what is truth or what is false right now. We're just going by some clues. We're thinking about what could happen. It's pretty damn cool. But I was thinking about what they're adding, and I remember one of the first discussions that we had on stream about the potential connection between Sire the Nephrius and the Nephrazim. And I remember back then I was a bit hesitant about the Nephrius being connected to Dreadlords. Not that it's an impossibility, right? The lore is very fluid, and it has changed many, many times over the years, and it will change many, many times more. But in the case of the Dreadlords, we already had somewhat of a picture of where they're from, what they've done so far. And I wonder if they're going to manage to make those puzzle pieces fit. Because the story of the Dreadlords goes back a long time. I mentioned the War of the Ancients 10,000 years ago. Many times that they infiltrated Azeroth. Many times that they fought for the Legion. And to now read about these manipulations actually originating from the Shadowlands. It's going to be interesting to see if they can actually fit those puzzle pieces. But at the same time, it's also kind of cool. To see that there's this overarching war, this overarching scheme coming from the domain of death that's been going on for a very long time. I really hope that they can pull it off. But yeah, I just wanted to add that last section as we have had many discussions on stream about this before. Many people months ago were like, hey, did you see the connection between the Dreadlords and the Nephrius? Now we have these books and I'm sure the beta is going to reveal more information. But yeah, some late night ramblings for you. Next week, we'll keep the speculation somewhat going, dive a bit into some of the hints on where the story could go, what is up with the Jailer, what is up with the Primus, all the good stuff. But for now, thank you very much for watching, everyone. Say that you're looking for more details on all the things that we talked about today, then check out the Delayed Wild article in the description down below. You could also subscribe if you like my videos, leave a like if you enjoyed this one, and by all means, let me know what you think of all of this in the comments down below. Are you hyped about the potential storytelling? Are you a bit bummed about the potential changes that might come to the story? What do you think is going on? Let me know. And until next time, see ya! The cunning ones kneel before six masters.